All right, round two is complete. All the players are done. We're back here, and we're going to satisfy Becky's curiosity and maybe some of yours as we're looking at the in-round results at the end of round two, and she said, oh, I wonder what this blue-black tempo deck is. So we have called it up, and here we see it is actually a zombies deck, not a rogues or ninjas build. And what do we see here? Oh, all right, so we've... We were kind of talking about like the importance of lords uh, in humans as it was like becoming slivers, but we have some lords here in the form of like Diagraph Captain, uh, Plague Belcher, kind of a cool card to see. I just remember playing that card in Amonkhet Limited. I remember playing Soul Diviner in War of the Spark Limited. Mm -hmm. This is, I have like it's it's looking at this. I have a hard time like in my mind telling how it would play out. It doesn't feel like what I would call tempo, this kind of just feels like, oh, aggressive zombie tribal. I don't know if I would have personally called it tempo, but it is really cool to see yeah. the actual list after being like, ooh, what could that possibly be? And it and, is interesting that it's not what we thought it was. This wasn't your guess, which is hard to believe. Yeah. So yeah, there uh, we have, and then we, Pyre of Heroes, which is from Kaldheim and has a lot of text, so... Let's go ahead and come back to the booth so we can pop that up a little bit bigger for people to see. Yeah, people to yeah. see. Is that something we can do on that screen? Pyre of Py Heroes. Pyre of Heroes. That's P Y R E for our director who um, is doing a great job today. The uh, you know it's funny. I was thinking about one time like what would happen if if we did a broadcast where I never knew like in advance what was going to pop up on the screen. It just happened and I had to react to it. But that's what happens anyway. Yeah, so, um, that is what happens. Phoebe no does that to... for us on the VML sometimes. <laughs> Run through that scenario. So if we have Pyre of Heroes, let's go ahead and take a look at that. It's a call time card uh, that we don't even... <laughs> okay, well, maybe we'll get it up or not. There it is, Pyre oh, of perfect. Heroes. So a call time card that if you've... Most of your experience with a set is with Limited, then you probably haven't seen this card because it doesn't get played. Yep, I haven't so, seen but, it. Don't uh, know what it does. Let's go ahead. So, Sacrifice a creature, two mana, sacrifice a creature, and then I believe you tutor a deck that's, yeah, a creature that's one higher in mana cost and, and put it into play. So in that zombie deck we just saw, for example, with Jarl's Messenger, you can sacrifice that, get a four drop, and then you keep your messenger, and it even gets bigger. And uh, you can, you know, chain up the curve, so that's interesting. Um, so birthing pod zombies. Yeah, yeah, okay. it is effectively birthing pod zombies. So, uh, and not an extreme mana cost, two to get into play, two to activate. Um, yeah, might be interesting to see that played out. And uh, with, yeah, with Undying, um, that's uh, basically just build a board. So, so that's pretty cool. And you're getting to play all the good zombies like uh, Crypt Breaker and Relentless Dead, which have been very popular in when they were in Standard and also popular in Pioneer on and off. So, this is cool. I am a big fan of this deck. Yeah, yeah. So, unfortunately, it got drubbed last round, so I don't know that we'll see it on camera this round, but the round is over, so players are getting situated round three, and we'll go ahead and spin up the full results now. We've got 85 players, I believe, today, so that's fantastic. Thanks, all of you that are playing, if you're watching along with us between rounds, that's awesome. Uh, if you're watching while playing in the arena sealed open today thanks for joining us uh if you're checking in occasionally that's hopefully your sealed decks bonanza w went fantastic today unlike my friends who um were going to give me <laughs> updates but in fact were eliminated before we, we even went on the air today so Aww. it doesn't always work out the way you want um we do have all kinds of different decks in the field here today i can see a boggles deck i see gift storm both of those losing i see the nausea deck um, it, which yeah. was supposedly dead without Spirit Guide, but in fact not dead at all. We we there was one in the five O dump. There is one in our event today, at least. And all the people who have lost at this point also certainly aren't out. We do have seven rounds, so there's sure. going to be a decent amount of people who still have a chance, even if you've kind of lost early on. Usually, what? it's a little disheartening for sure. But Ramon Correa, Mono Blue Tron. Uh, it's 2-0, yeah? We're going to have words. Oh, well, 2-0 this round. Oh, okay. It might be 2-0. Um, may not. That information is not available on the screen, but we'll, uh, yeah, 
Well, to see about that. Prison as deck. The, uh, Every time I see a deck and I'm like, that sounds like a cool name, they've lost, and I'm a little sad. But it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> stupid people playing the, you know, the top of the metagame decks and aim decks and, and winning their matches. But this is the beginning. Um, we don't know what the top of the metagame is. We don't even, even if we do know, like, if, if we know, if we say Bring to Light Omnath is the deck of the format, that you don't even know what that means because there are be multiple different. We saw Bring to Light with Valky. We saw Omnath with Nahiri and Emrakul. There could be any number of things going on um, as it, it takes, I don't know, how, how long would you say before it takes for the dust to settle? Were, yeah. Like, at what point, how many weeks into a format would you say, this, I'm confident this will look like what the format looks like at the end of the format in two months or so? Does it take two weeks? Does it take a month? Like, what I do you feel think? like it takes about three weeks. Okay. Typically. Yeah. I mean, in, especially, like, also in standard. Like, sometimes, sometimes an Omnath is in the format, and mm -hmm. the best deck in the format is found out immediately. Sure. But sometimes there's a Soul Tide Ultimatum that was printed, you know, a few sets ago, and then a big Planeswalker that was printed recently, and it takes a few weeks for people to find out about this Sultimatum deck. Right. But, yeah, so. that definitely happens. So, we're gonna go head to the... Alright, the match may have started, so let's get oh. in there real quick. Jump in. Let's go. I believe we're watching Wright versus David Goldfarb. That is incorrect. We're watching Connor Mullally versus... Whoa. We're watching Joseph Schuster is... versus Julian John? I'm not sure what we're. Well, I don't know, but according to the yeah, the, yeah, it's yeah, it's game three, it's okay. which is definitely not the case. So let's go ahead and we'll get that sorted out. In the meantime, yeah, we we're just saying how um, it takes some time for the format to get sorted out. There was a Twitter, a couple of Twitter threads recently in the last week, talking about how in old extended, how even at the end of the season or at the end of kind of evolutions, the, the decks were just so bad and so crazy because. When, you know, even like mid 2000s, the internet existed, message boards existed, that kind of thing mm -hmm. exists, but social media wasn't really running like it is today. Oh, and things yeah. were just slower. Mm -hmm. And um, um, things true. evolved yeah. faster, but uh, still not, there's still a couple week or two where it's kind of wild out there, like mm -hmm. like today. And there's there's multiple different builds of within the archetypes, whereas a month from now, probably all the just case stoneforge decks will be within a couple cards of each other whereas now yeah. that we have, okay, now i'm told the match might be ready to go okay so we have joseph sumter who's ahead nine games to zero against julian john that's probably not right Whoa. however the decks might be correct so let's <laughs> roll with it oh and it looks like julian john is playing at least something similar to what i would have liked to have played in a blue red prowess strategy we see a little sprite dragon in play so i'm already very excited mm -hmm. and we see so we previewed earlier black white pox this is the eight rack mono black pox it looks like mm -hmm. and so we have the rack effects which is different and there are two in hand so Oof. the smallpox will resolve wipe out one of those creatures probably the Swift Spear, and as long as more removal is drawn, one more removal spell is drawn. Liliana isn't quite there yet, as we're going to need another land and another black source. Mm -hmm. But if that were to happen, Joseph might be able to get some, some real work going here as the Shrieking Affliction in the Rack we're going to take long to finish off finish off Julian, but mm -hmm. Sprite Dragon does need to be removed. Yeah, otherwise it's just going to grow from a little tiny Sprite Dragon into probably a big, almost Glory Ringer sized dragon if I had to, right. if I had to guess. Uh, we see it. Oh, all right. I was wondering what the green mana was for, but Mutagenic Growth makes a lot of sense. Kind of save ourselves the life total here and yeah. make the Sprite Dragon a little bit bigger. The alternate cast of paying mana for it. So <laughs> nobody Sprite, ever does that though. <laughs> Sprite Dragon comes in and okay, that is a good draw. A black source was needed. There is one. And so now, yeah, Joseph can dump both the rack and Shrieking Affliction, which is similar to the rack. And if a creature isn't drawn this turn by Julian, then Joseph has got some real um 
you know, he's, he's got real a real position here. coming out. <laughs> yeah, because Julian's life total is not going to last too long like this. That's not a creature. That actually, that lightning bolt actually does as much damage to Julian as it does to Joseph. Mm-hmm. Oh, but with the, coupled with this light up the stage in this. Uh, but no I creature. Think. This I th I think Joseph is going to win this game. I think this yeah. is too late. Uh, going to throw. Okay, it's going to be really close. Maybe maybe mm -hmm. not. Yeah, three oh, lives is pretty. Wait, no, no, no! The wind's on the board. Is, oh. is it not? Or wait, is that the turn away? If by casting affliction, the shrieking affliction. No, you would. It would. And Julian would go with, to one. No, no, you could attack with no. Vault. Oh, oh, you're totally correct. Oh, this okay. is one of those situations where you get so in your head about a certain game plan that you just start to ignore yeah. the cards that you draw. Okay, so Julian goes to four from the rack effects and, and the affliction and the land is drawn. So Julian needs to ooh. You know what? He oh yeah, so he needs to attack he attack for one, light the stage into a burn spell to take this down. Ooh. This game is very close. Yeah. I mean, I would kind of expect this from BC yeah. decks. Like sure. a very aggressive deck versus the deck that is saying if you have no cards in hand which aggressive decks usually lose all the cards in hand quite quickly Ooh, it's Ooh. Not there. and joseph is gonna squeak this game out wow all right so, we were worried he might be punished for uh we were worried yeah. he might be punished for missing the lethal that was presented yeah. off of drawing the shrieking affliction but it turns out that it worked yeah. out in his favor oh, anyway now, may maybe i miss misread something there but i i think it looked it looked like it was there. The Especially it, considering uh, that Julian John had no cards in hand. We right, knew the right, two right. cards flipped over from light yeah. of the stage. I believe you're correct. Anyway, all right, let's go ahead and look at this. This one should be exciting, especially, yeah, Joseph Schuster, eight rack. So, oh. and I love how we have the actual, this is my kind of style, having the actual original artwork on the rack. If <laughs> Becky was in charge, we'd have some some new <laughs> version that no one recognized and sure it might be a higher quality piece of art, but there's no, <laughs> there's no authenticity to no, it. No, so... so I, I like the art, the newer arts to look at. However, to play with, I'm typically an all original art kind of person, except for maybe with basic lands. With basic lands, I like to play around a little bit. But typically with a lot of arts, I like to have whatever is the original art. And I'm quite a big fan of especially brown border cards. So, sure. so I'm a fan have, of this original rack. So this is even a rack because there are two Davriels in this deck. This might be 10 rack. Oh, anyway, okay. So we have a really um, Thoughtseize. Not as best here. Maybe even get boarded out. Removal good. Um, do we have removal in the signboard to bring in? We have ensnaring bridges. That's good. Collective brutality is fantastic, right? Mm -hmm. Well, she serves good. All right, let's go to Julian's blue red deck. See how similar it is to what Becky wanted to play today. Looks pretty close. The biggest difference I can see is the vapor snags that are in the main board instead of in the sideboard, as well as is not playing for Kozlex Return and is playing to Blood Moon, which I think is a probably a pretty good direction to end up going in uh, mm -hmm. for Kozlex Return. Kind of a lot, but I think at the start of a format, you expect a lot of people to be playing very aggressive styles, so I like personally overboarding on big removal spells mm -hmm. but i do think that the blood moon is a better kind of catch-all you see a lot of people doing very land centric strategies in modern as a tron player myself big agree uh so i think that i like julian john's sideboard quite a bit especially mm -hmm. as somebody who was had the intention of submitting a similar list to this three spell pierce that's a lot and that is going to come up big here now oh, it would be yeah. interesting to see um is it will spell pierce Will has the potential to disrupt Julian's aggressive curve mm -hmm. because the Pox deck has a lot of early plays that matter. So can Julian find a way to fit that into the curve while still pushing through damage? That I makes having a one drop even more important yeah, for yeah. Julian, I think. Exactly. I was about to say, I think that it is ultimately so much more important that you get a really cheap creature. Maybe postpone some of the quote-unquote bigger creatures that the blue-red prowess deck is playing, focus on one small creature, holding up counter magic and instant spells, and then using the smaller creature to get through the rest of the damage. And this is a good start. We've got a soul scar mage down to start. Yep, one drop in play, and Joseph has, there's a third land, that's significant. 
and yeah, just start right away cranking away on discard spells. And this is, I mean, oh, okay, Lava Dart's a nice card to be able to discard. Oh, yeah, that there feels are, pretty uh, good. There is potential. I mean, Julian will jump out to a life point lead in any game between these decks, but mm-hmm. with two rack effects in hand again for Joseph, I mean, that's a result last game. Those the damage adds up very quickly when your opponent's empty handed. Mm hmm. Oh, Julian John kept a one lander. Sure, with no play. And so I wonder if we kept a one lander because there's a spell pierce in our hand, and we, again, we were kind of talking about this earlier in a game as well, really prioritizing the uh, the presence of sideboard cards. Never yeah. Just didn't want to mulligan. Probably is like yeah. mulliganing really bad against an eight rack deck. So right. I yeah. don't want to yeah. sacrifice cards in hand. Let's yeah, go ahead I, and just yeah. You're, Absolutely right about that. Molly against the Iraq deck is much worse than against a normal deck. So it, 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 keeping one line hand that is at least somewhat decent makes a lot of sense. But yeah, Wrench Mind goes ahead and picks off two cards and potential for two more. And there's not a Blue Man untapped. So... And no spell pierce possible. No, no. Soul Scar Mage is not... I mean, do we play Liliana here? Do we play Wrench Mind? I feel like I would just get the Liliana and play as fast as possible, but I've also never played 8-Rack in my life, and it looks like Wrench Mind is the choice. Yeah, Wrench Mind fires off. This does allow the Rack to come down, and the damage race actually begins. And Soul Scar Mage is not like Sprite Dragon. It does not permanently gain the counters, so every turn it starts over at one power. I think Julian John is very close to being out of this game. Yeah, this is going to be a very fast match, which I suppose we could have force on both of these are kind of quote-unquote aggressive decks i feel like (laughs) eight rack now named ten rack uh for everyone watching is it kind of is going to mirror whatever and there's a lot of decks in a format like this that kind of just like mirror the speed of whatever the opponent is playing if somebody else is playing a fast deck then you're going to also be playing at a fast pace. And if your opponent is playing something that is very controlly and slow, you're probably also going to be going at a rather slow pace. And I think that uh, the 8-rack slash 10-rack deck is kind of falling into that category. All right, so Julian getting a little bit more board presence here as we see at the cost of a land, the Lava Dart plus Cheap Stormwing Entity and Scry, so that's nice. Joseph is, I think if Joseph draws a Black Source this turn, then picking off both creatures is possible. Otherwise, Liliana is only going to hit the Soul Scar Mage, and that's not great. Not the worst, but yeah, definitely not great. The Storm Ring Entity, if it is allowed to stay on the field, is certainly going to be... We don't have to worry about it. I think that we are cleaning both of those up this turn pretty easily, and then having both of our Rikes in play coming up on this next turn. Yeah, this is... Oh, Joseph is at 14 life. I don't even know if it's... how. Okay. No, I don't don't think it's possible. (laughs) Bedlam Reveler would be the best way to come back. There is one in Julian's deck. That's true. I don't... One, two, three... But we are so far away from casting. Yeah, there's not a sufficient number of instants in the graveyard to cast for two mana. I believe right now it costs four, and Julian doesn't have it. Sprite Dragon, sure. Pick off Liliana, untap, take... Eight. <laughs> yep. Counting the Muta Vault this time, and that is there's no yeah. If if with Shrieking Affliction plus Ooh. the Muta Vault hit, <sighs> Julian can't even cast. Okay, well this works too. Yeah. Remove the creature here and there. I don't believe there. I don't think Julian's deck has it out to this. No, I don't think so either. And I mean, uh, if I was going to look at, if I was, again, if I was registering this deck coming into this tournament and I saw that my opponent was going to be playing an A-Rack deck, I would probably be a little tilted. um, Because this matchup seems absolutely horrendous if my opponent sees any amount of smallpox discard. I And you are just playing so many redundant rack effects that it is so difficult to actually keep any amount of life total while still being able to execute your game plan. And they're a black deck, so they're going to be playing a ton of removal for all of your creatures that are supposed to be getting big and doing all the damage for you. So, yeah, it 
goes the way of J- Joseph Schuster and Julian John is going to go to two and one. Two and one. That was a slaughter. Oh, that's putting oh. it nicely, I think. Yeah, that was, I mean, the, the lands needed to come at the right time, but even if it didn't, I'm not sure that Julian was going to be in a good position there because it's just, yeah, you know, we have lightning bolts, burst lightning, sure, but the rack and tree affliction, that's a bolt every turn. Mm-hmm. Once Julian's hand is depleted, and that just doesn't take long with the wrench mines and no, the spell pierces didn't show up. No, nope. uh, and they would have been really nice that game if they yeah. did though. Yeah, although whether they would have been would up to been enough, yeah, yeah, I don't know. That is tough, but uh, so Julian John takes a loss there. Um, kind of caught us off guard here. That match ended rather quickly, <laughs> so uh, we're going to. Get some of our players who are 3 0 once some of the matches start to finish, and maybe we'll take a look at some of the 3 0 deck lists. Mm-hmm. In the meantime, uh, we have so called time cards that we have seen kind of influencing our modern deck lists so far. We we saw um, in some of the deck lists we looked at this morning, we saw a Kasima, uh, God of Voyages, I believe is the name. If we can put that up on the screen, let's go ahead and see that. God of uh, the Voyage. God of the Voyage, thank you. That it was messing me up on the VML stream. There's binding of binding the old gods. It's not binding of the old gods, which is always what I want to call it. It's just binding the <laughs> old gods. And it messes me up because there was a Theros saga that was binding of the Titans or something right. like that. Sure. And so I keep wanting to call it like that. And it's it's not the same. But Kasama, God of the Voyage, is at the beginning of your upkeep. You may exile Kasama. If you do, it gains what whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control. If Kasama is exiled, you may put a Voyage counter on it. If you don't, return Kasama to the battlefield with a plus one, plus one counter on it and draw X cards where X is the number of Voyage counters on it. So this is kind of just an interesting way to be gaining some amount of advantage. And it's kind of difficult to interact with. Yeah, so this card is pretty cool. It's it's kind of a nuisance having to uh, playing on uh, Magic Arena and having to interpret what its abilities, its triggers do. Oh yeah, extremely. Twice a turn, it asks you, "Hey, do you want to do this or not?" And you have to read the card if you're me, like four times <laughs> to even have some idea of what's going on. But the way this plays out is, um, you ideally you play this on turn three, or mm-hmm. if you have Noble Hierarch or something on turn two. And it's there's a blocker for one turn, and then your next upkeep is gone. So it doesn't actually get to attack. It can. You don't have to remove it. Mm-hmm. But um, by and, May and, we mean likely. Yeah, and then so what we'd like to have happen is you play a play a fetch land, crack your fetch land, which you know gets whatever other land. So then two counters go on Casima, and then I would say, in the ideal scenario, next turn you play another fetch land, which is a third counter fetch and then with that card coming um that land coming to play you then choose to bring the casima in mm-hmm. and at that point after you know a two turn delay you end up with a five seven that draws you three cards that's pretty awesome i would think um in yeah. limited it doesn't play out quite like that but in modern <laughs> there's a lot of potential the fetch lands working out there's also a back side of this card True. which is a two mana vehicle which um can it's a crew one three three so it's basically yeah. smuggler's copter yeah yeah and it can generate some advantage from the opponents uh you can you can gain the land in play there it is the omen keel mm-hmm. um whenever oh i'm sorry it's whenever a vehicle not even specifically it but i don't but know the decks aren't playing any other vehicles yeah. so that's not really a concern right um yet whenever it deals commentators a player they mill a couple cards or exile a couple cards and if there's a land in there, then you can play it. The you know what vehicles like shouldn't I don't know um, equipment w- that come into play with creatures like the batter skull uh-huh. has a germ right? It yeah. comes with a germ. Shouldn't the batter skull count as a vehicle for that germ? Why doesn't that trigger off Omen Keel? It's an equipment, but it's I don't know. It's kind <laughs> they of would have to read a batter skull to be a vehicle. No, I'm just but like. I mean, some yeah, some equipment are like weapons, and some are like big things. I mean, it's okay. like the no, germ. I... The batter skull is huge. It's like a tank. You know, it, it certainly is. Even in the art, it kind of looks like a little yeah. bit of a vehicle. I don't even know what the art looks like, but yeah, I, I, I think I think that's a flavor fail there. Anyway, 
Um, Kasima, we saw in the Bring to Light deck with um, the Omnath deck, and there's just tons of fetch lands. And I'd be interested to seeing how that might play out today. What's uh, what's a call name card that uh, you think um, might show up today or in modern? I don't know. I should put you on the spot like that. Yeah, no, it's okay. Uh, so we have seen both like Pyre of Heroes, but we've already talked about Pyre of Heroes. We could right. maybe talk a little about, bit about Toski if we wanted yeah. to. Yeah. Uh, again, like even though we've already talked about Toski. Well, Somebody, that was like two hours ago. That was two hours. Yeah, exactly. So we can talk about it again. Somebody also made a uh, very fun comment in chat that the Bant uh, Toski deck that we looked at should be renamed to Squirrel Blade. <laughs> and I, I thought that that was quite fun. And uh, that's board. probably what I'm going to call it. I actually, there was actually a thread uh, from one of the high level judges this week about how maybe. We should go back to letting players name their decks instead of calling everything like team or mid range, so it's all you know generic names, and let them go back to calling uh-huh. what they want, like Squirrel Blade. Yeah, Toski yeah. Bearer of Secrets. Uh, we talked about this extensively this morning in the version of the stream that did not get streamed, and then briefly later on. But Toski Bearer of Secrets, four abilities for four mana, one one. Mm-hmm. The spell can't be countered. That's an important one when you're when you're when you're spending four mana on a permanent that doesn't take over the game by itself, you really can't afford to just be wasting your mana. But, okay, you know it's going to resolve. It's indestructible, so you know it's not going to die. Uh, it attacks each turn, which is not great, but in Modern, we're playing it in Stoneforge decks, so it could be equipped. So mm-hmm. the fact that it's a 1-1 attacking, you know, doesn't necessarily mean it's just a free block for whatever. Yeah. And then whenever any creature you control deals common damage to a player, draw a card. So if your spell callers are hitting, uh, if your, you know, Birds of Paradise... As long as you have no wire, you know, whatever. If the flying gets through, if you have um, <laughs> blue green snow, death touch flyer, one one that I somehow can't remember. I think right now. Yeah, that one. Uh, anything. Um, and it's not maxed out on one card turn. Like if you hit with three creatures, mm-hmm. you draw one card, you get three. Yeah. So okay. if you're playing against a creatureless deck, if you're uh, a control deck, playing a combo deck, um, you know, this. This card's really... going to be very pesky to deal with. Yeah, yeah. And it, it lives through a lot of the, well, a lot of the, basically every single white uh, board wipe. Like yeah. Same verdict doesn't get rid of it. It's as indestructible. Sure. So you spend your entire turn maybe trying to, like, clean up the board, and Toski's still just going to sit on the field and be like, okay, you have nothing in play. I'm going to attack, and yeah. I'm going to draw my controller a card. Yeah, yeah. Either even the rest from the opponent or from yourself. You can mm-hmm. just have their Toski get rid of their stuff, and yeah, it's just really sweet. Um, so I would be interested. Three is a lot, but um, we're also early in the development of you know the new cards being implemented. Maybe the player's like, well, I don't know if I want one or four of these. Let's run three so we draw it a lot and see what happens, because that's yeah. kind of what you do. Exactly. Anyway, so uh, yeah, call time cards all over the format, it turns out. Um, let's go ahead now and look at, we do have uh, a 3-0 player who's mad, so let's go ahead and look at... Okay. Nigel Hagley's Amulet Titan deck is 3-0. and oh. So, again, like we mentioned before, green-white Titan with, you know, basically splashing Valakut off of uh, Dryad of the Elysian Grove was a mm-hmm. thing before, but that was also with Field of the Dead. No Field of the Dead, no more splashing Valakut, apparently. Yeah. I mean, and we do still have no mountains in this list. So, we are well, still kind of relying on Dryad of Elysian Grove to make our Valakut be lethal, right. if that is our game plan. Yeah, well, it's in here. I mean, you're right. It is in here. Um, but this is um, more of what we would have seen from an amulet deck a year ago mm-hmm. or two years ago. Yeah, where exactly. it's, pri- it's Primeval Titan with Amulet Vigor trying to, you know, generate a ton of advantage, haste over, and, and blow the crap out of somebody. Yeah. Uh, with Karn the Great Creator to make it a little bit sweeter. Yeah. Yeah. Karn the Great Creator is nice. It gives you something else to do uh, when you don't always have Primeval Titan or a Summoner's Pact. Mm-hmm. And this deck is, I don't know if it's better than the Green-White Titan decks, but this deck is scarier, I would say. It is faster. It can end the game. I mean, there are ridiculous, there, there's potential for turn two kills in this deck. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, turn three or four is not, um, I mean, all, the, all the fast kills require amulet, but this deck is tough. It's not easy to play against, mm-hmm. you know, whether you're playing, you know, contr- counters, whether you're playing, you know, it is it is more susceptible to Path to Exile than before. Oh, that's for sure. Because Field of Dead is gone. 
But then, yeah, Car the Great Creator gives you a whole another route to messing with your opponent. This is yeah. this is cool, and I'm not at all surprised to see a deck like this be three zero. Yeah, and it's always cool when you see a card in the deck, you immediately have to turn your eyes to the sideboard and look mm -hmm. at what those artifact workshop cards are in the sideboard. And it looks like we've got a uh, Worm Coil Engine, Walking Ballista as the two artifact creatures. You could put Sco Sovereign Console Flagship as like an honorary creature, as it is a vehicle, um, kind of just giving us different avenues to attack our opponents or answer threats or protect ourselves from th certain threats in the case of Worm Coil Engine, likely. Uh, engineered Explosive and Tormund's Crypt and Grapdigger's Cage as some kind of defensive cards that are going to allow us to interact with our opponent's graveyards as well as smaller things on the field. And then Crucible of Worlds, which I think is, it's always one of those cards that like I read it and I'm like, wow, that sounds so strong. It sounds great. And as a Tron player, you're immediately like, cool, I can get back the cards that I've had destroyed on my field. In in practice, I feel like it's never actually been as great as I would like it to be, but mm -hmm. it is nice to see it in the sideboard, and it's nicer for a deck like this that's able to just get a little bit of redundancy and is a little bit more controlling than Tron can be sometimes. Right, and all and in this deck where you have like there's only one land that gives haste to your creatures, unlike like four versus towers. So mm -hmm. if that gets blown up, it's gone. But the Crucible does allow you to bring it back, you, even though you don't have other ones to pull out of your deck. So yeah. A fast, redundant deck. Um, no shock that it's 3-0. We do have a Mardu Pyromancer deck that is 3-0, oh. so let's take a look at this one. It's been a while since we've seen this archetype. I feel like it kind of died out, but it's cool. We did see, I did see a similar list in the decklist dump that was uh, just like Black-Red Pyromancer. Uh, so it wasn't playing the white for both Lingering Souls and Stormforge Mystic in this case, but I think that it's a great uh, addition, as well as the Kaya's Guile, which I think is a cool modal card that can serve a lot of different purposes. But I think the inclusion of Kroxa, Titan of Death Hunger, is an extremely great card to be playing. And the Magmatic Channelers are also very cool in a deck mm -hmm. that is going to be playing a lot of cheap early spells, just basically getting to play, hopefully, a two-mana 4-4 four -four in the later game. But Ultimately, we do talk about how often the two things that happen in in modern is there's going to be a lot of graveyard hate and there's going to be a lot of land hate, and this deck could be really susceptible to some graveyard hate. Some of it, yeah, but this is, uh, you know, these cards still, well, they're not blanked by graveyard hate. Certainly true. Like this, we're still functioning here. It's not like Blood Moon against Tron where it's like, crap, I need to deal with the Blood Moon or I can't do anything. That's uh, you know, Kroxa is not great against Graveyard Hate, you know, I uh, I will grant you. But it's, like, you're still getting, you're still spending two mana to make your opponent discard a card with a potential for damage. That's something. Magmatic Chandler, it's still, you know, you can trade a land in for a spell. That It's still something. But mm -hmm. but you're right. You know, Graveyard, like, Leyline is, like, a lot of these decks, uh, Graveyard decks, Leyline, Tormod's Crypt, whatever, you know, it's Graveyard Hate, it doesn't really matter. Against deck yeah. like this, you really need something consistent, because mm -hmm. if you have Tormod's Crypt against this this deck, or Nihil's Spellbomb, like this deck has itself in its sideboard, yeah, you can, you know, you can activate it, and sure, you can get rid of a Kroxa, but yeah. then something else is going to go in there that you're going to deal with also, Lingering Souls or, you know, whatever else. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, Lingering Souls was sort of Feast and Famine. Okay, now this one, I feel like, this like a, a, a spirit token with sort of feast of famine does not feel like a vehicle. So yeah, maybe my rule <laughs> change with with Kasima isn't quite applicable to everything. German Battle Skull, yes. Sky yeah. Sovereign Console Flagship, that feels like it could be a vehicle. Sort of feast of famine, not. Yeah. So but, yeah, it's probably uh, safe to just leave it the way it is. This is one of the things also I want to highlight. Where in modern we have these archetypes that have existed kind of for a long time, and with the inclusion of new cards, you kind of see them resurface. Mm -hmm. With the inclusion of new, of new cards and the bannings of some other cards, this yeah. has been able to come back into the format as a strong, kind of aggressively slanted mid-range control strategy. Mm -hmm. And it's cool to see how newer cards are coming into decks like this in Modern, and Kroxa and Magmatic Channeling are both very strong, very cool cards yeah. that I'm excited to see play out in a deck like this. Yeah, I like it. All right, we have another player that's doing well. Uh, we're going to look at a green-white Heliod deck, which is not a new deck, but um, is something that is, you know, back as a force in the metagame as some of the dominant decks from the previous 
couple weeks have been removed. And again, we're just uh, that match was fast, so we're filling a little time here. If you're just tuning in right now, wondering where is the magic, we uh, <laughs> in the middle of round three, and um, we're looking at some of the decks that are doing well on the day. Yeah, Adam Lappin here, Greenwood Heliod, and we have yeah. I mean, this deck is this isn't going to look this. Some of these decks it looks like they came back from two years ago or a year ago. This deck came <laughs> I was going to say. Like, this Four deck is playing ago. Spike Feeder. Yeah. <laughs> but this deck came back from a few months ago. Maybe even didn't totally go away. But mm -hmm. certainly its position is strengthened now. As we're... Um, the card that really put this deck up is Helia the Suncrowned. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a deck with a couple different infinite combos here. We can either gain life or do damage. Mm -hmm. um, both of them involving Heliod. Mm -hmm. And... We have a somewhat of a beatdown presence, although it's not, I would say, a strong one. But then we have Ranger Captain Devios, which is kind of our protection mm -hmm. for our spells. And um, Skyclave Apparition, which is a card within the last year that's really changed what white is capable of. Yeah. There was, uh, I would say, it was fair for players that preferred white cards to complain, hey, you know, our cards aren't really as strong as some of the other colors. It feels like when things get printed. Skyclave Apparition... Not. <laughs> right. At least tilts things a little bit, maybe not in favor of white, but it bounces out a little bit. Is this 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 little guy is really strong. Three oh, mana two sure. two, wipe out anything that costs less than four. And so it's it's able to trade upwards on mana. Mm -hmm. And um more importantly, when um when it dies, they don't get the actual card back. They just get a token, which is probably less damaging than the actual permanent. I remember when this was um printed we were doing a legacy broadcast and honor Agassa was really excited about this card in legacy. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, we're seeing, I mean, the ability to faceless butcher a planeswalker. That's pretty nice. Certainly true. I feel like I also have to mention kind of a newer card. That's kind of like going under the radar in this deck is conclave mentor. It's going to have some nice combos with like the Heliod and uh, some other few things. And it's basically a centaur cleric doing its best winding constrictor impression. Sure. Uh, came yeah. out in M21. So it's relatively new as well. And is going to just like add a lot of extra counters and also maybe gain us a little bit of life in the process of it being in this deck. So I think it's a cool inclusion. All right. So let's go ahead and come back to the booth. Now that's a few decks that we have in our field, our field today. And, um, yeah, maybe maybe while we're we're gonna take a break for a few minutes and let some of the more matches finish up in the round, and maybe we can contemplate relatively new Conclave Mentor M twenty one. Now, uh, you don't think that that's relatively new? No, I think it's new. I don't okay. think it's relatively new. Okay, 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 okay. Um, you know, because you know, some of us, some of us are not um, young and in the prime of our youth, and we've been playing this game for a long time. That's relatively right, new is like. <laughs> equipment okay yeah no maybe not that fun. much but yeah anyway um we're gonna step away we'll be back in a few minutes and see how the end of round three played out and get round four going so thanks for being with us we'll be here all day today playing modern 